Hey everyone, welcome, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you happen to be. My name is Joe Brady, and I'm just going to be your host today. I'm really excited to have with us Mark Munch, who's going to go over some really cool uh, photo tips for us. Uh, I'm going to let Mark introduce himself and tell us what he's been up to, because I can't keep up with the man. He's, he's, he's always on the move. So, Mark, welcome. Good to have you here with us again. Hi, Joe. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's always fun to talk shop, especially nowadays with all this new exciting equipment and places to go around the world. And yeah, I have been all over the place this year, so I don't even know if uh, I can keep up with myself. <laughs> all right, well, it's fun. I'm going to sign off, mute myself, and again, anybody has any questions, just put them in the questions control panel. And Mark, take it away. All right, thanks, Joe. So uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about post-processing, actually mostly about post-processing. Um, you know, I I started digital photography uh, back in 2006, but before that, I was working with digital files for years because one of the jobs I had was converting all of my father's and grandfather's four by five transparencies to uh, digital files. And so I started this journey a long time ago, and it's it's been a long one. In fact, uh, one of the the best parts of it is that uh, I actually had to learn it all after I graduated from Art Center where they taught me nothing about digital photography. So most of it was self-taught and then of course uh, nowadays there's all kinds of literature and uh, good bits of information to read about uh, which is part of what I do and so uh, one of uh, my jobs originally was commercial photography. I photographed landscapes for all kinds of magazines and brochures and then also for uh, skiing magazines in particular and that was really some of the the best uh, photography that uh, that I was able to uh, produce back when I was doing commercial work and then uh, things changed and now what I'm doing is guiding photography workshops around the world and so uh, I own a company called Mutch Workshops and you can find us at MutchWorkshops.com and you'll also see on our blog I do all kinds of videos or several videos on processing HDR different ways and then also uh, we talk about equipment and all kinds of good places to go. You can go to our workshops tab and see some of the cool places we're going to be visiting this year and the next year as well. So workshops really have gotten me a lot closer to understanding my own workflow uh, more than just conducting it myself. Believe that, believe it or not, because I have to be able to explain these things accurately and, and coherently so uh, it really has helped me understand not only digital processing more but uh, also improve I think. So one of the things I've realized is that with raw image files and Lightroom this day and age really the idea of a workflow can be very creative. It doesn't have to have a regimented order. In fact with that in mind I think that there's an important relationship that I've discovered in processing and it's between contrast and color and I look at it in terms of a relationship because sometimes when you affect one you can then go back and affect the other and the main point here is that not always do you have to follow the order that Lightroom engineers develop the develop module in and so that's what I want to show and talk about today in order to get my workflow somewhat uh, uh, give you some orders for it, uh, the first thing I look at is technical. And so I do a lot of stuff that I want to get over with in a hurry and kind of in the background. And let's just go over some of the very basic things that I want to make sure you understand. First of all, your monitor has to be calibrated. And thanks to X-Rite, we have the i1 Display Pro, which is what I use on all my monitors. That really helps me uh, stay grounded with the colors I'm looking at. And the next item I use by x rite is the color checker. And this just makes a profile for my camera. So in combination, these two things really help me with the technical side of the workflow. Um, and in addition to that, I want to show or talk about some of the things I do when I bring images into Lightroom. And there's about three of them that I do upon importing. And I save those in what's called an import 
profile. And let's just go over those really quickly so we can get on to the creative stuff. First one is the camera calibration. And inside here, after you make one of these color checker profiles for your camera, you're going to find the calibration profiles that you created. And you can see here when I apply it, it changes some of the color patches in the color checker, which is why you want to do it, because it'll give you more accurate color. The next one is lens correction. And this one's become very powerful over the last few years with Lightroom improving by enabling the profile correction for the lens and also checking the remove chromatic aberrations. That really eliminates a lot of the problems that, uh, well, even some of the better lenses like Zeiss and any lens manufacturer has to deal with uh, these issues and chromatic aberrations are one of them that will show up in the corners of pictures. Uh, it looks like uh, the old time newspaper when you'd see an off-register cartoon. So in this case you're going to get nice sharp detail. And speaking of detail, the last thing I will change uh, in in my uh, import settings is a sharpening and I'll do a default sharpening for every particular type of camera. In this case this is an Olympus. Um, and let's say those are the default settings for my detail and the lens. And the next thing you want to do in creating an import setting is come over here and just give it a title and in this case it's going to be the Olympus and I want to check all these boxes because I haven't changed anything else in the develop module and then click create and that's going to show up right here on the left under presets when you're in the develop module. That's also going to show up upon import so you can apply it there or if you forget you can also apply it here. So that's kind of some of the uh, personal hygiene, as I like to call it. You just have to do this stuff, otherwise well, you can end up looking kind of homeless. Um, so that gets us on to the creative side of things. And this is really stage two of my workflow. You can see how fast stage one went. <laughs> Get that over with as fast as we can. Uh, in many cases, though, I will go back to one of those, and that is the detail sliders for sharpness and luminosity because sometimes those change on night scenes and so forth. All right, so the creative side of post-processing images. Um, this is the part that can change and you know I look at post-processing as as a fun opportunity to become familiar with the image that I took and to try and get it back to what not only I saw but what I had pre-visualized because sometimes there's a variation in there it's not exactly how uh, I visualized it based on the light and the conditions. So a lot of what goes on here in the post-processing is creative and doesn't matter if it's entirely accurate. So what are some of the things I look at? Well, after looking at files, as long as I have, I like to separate it into four categories. And the first one is really luminosity. So if you, I like to look at luminosity first and then followed by contrast and then I go into the regions and I control contrast and luminosity within those certain regions and I'll show you all about that in a second and then last would be color and white balance together and so I'm going to show you a couple ways to handle those different uh, methods that I'm talking about or different steps that is and let's just for example go in here to the tone curve. This is probably one of my favorite panels inside the uh, Lightroom develop module and your tone curve is probably going to look like this when you open it if you haven't opened it and changed it. And What I'm going to have you do is on the far lower right hand corner of that window is click that little box and that allows you to grab the curve just about anywhere and put multiple nodes I call them nodes onto the curve if you hover over it, you can drag it off again. And what this allows me to do is fairly quickly come in here and change the luminosity of the whole image. And you can see what happens to the colors. They get washed out and they change considerably with the amount of luminosity alone. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. And then if you change the contrast, I can easily lower, darken the shadows and increase the highlights a little bit and that will also change the colors radically as well. 
So you can see before I touch anything else as far as saturation and white balance how much the luminosity and the contrast change the image. So I don't want you, get a, you guys to just look at a color checker. Let's go to an actual image. This one was taken on Snipefelsnes Peninsula in Iceland, which is actually where I'm going to be Tuesday. I fly back to Iceland on Sunday, and uh, I'll be in Reykjavik on Monday, and then uh, Snipefelsnes looking at this exact same mountain on Tuesday. Hopefully it'll look as clear and nice. So this image was taken in the morning and I exposed it so that I would get a proper histogram as you see up here in the upper right hand corner. But this really isn't the color interest I think that this image should create. So what I'm going to do is I go into the tone curve and all, I, all I'm going to do is drag this down until I get the colors that I'm interested in seeing which is right now at the top of the mountain. And if I drag this up, sometimes I can look in shadows. Some images have darker shadows so that I can study what I might want to extract out of those shadows by just simply dragging this curve up and taking a look around at all the areas in the image. So let's for a second go back down and just assume that this is about the luminosity that I would like. And with one more change or edit, I can grab the upper right hand corner of this curve and drag it over until the histogram meets the edge of the graph. And now with two quick moves, I've pretty much recreated this image. And you can see how drastically it has changed the colors. All the saturation that showed up and that's mostly because of the density and a little bit because of the contrast okay and so you can see how much that's changed this image and I haven't even done any filter used any filters or any any brushes for the next image I'm going to take you to another place in Iceland and this is over on the south coast near a place called Vik beautiful location and one morning we just had this incredible wind that was blowing right in our face. I think this was back in February. And for about 15 seconds, the sun showed up right on the horizon. It's quite dramatic. So let's take a look at a couple things in here that I might want to change. So here's an example where, you know, I was standing out there on the bluff and it was dark and windy, and so I didn't get the horizon exactly straight. So if you go into lens correction, you can see here that uh, two things. One is I forgot to check my import profile so that's a good tip now you can come over here to your import profile in this case the D800 and daylight and then I'm gonna click the level button and let's see if it works and it did that makes it very handy so that we don't have to go in there and try and guess on making this horizon level okay so if I want to look at this image in the same way I'm gonna grab the tone curve and drag it down and I actually think that the majority of the image in this case is going to get too dark. So I'm going to drag it up and look at some of that detail in the shadows. But I do notice that when I'm doing this, I actually prefer the density and the saturation of the sun when it's at this lower level of, of luminosity. And so with that in mind, then I realize I have to break this image up into regions. And you have three tools in Lightroom. One of them is the graduated filter right here. And the other is the radial filter, which is new to uh, Lightroom 5. And then we have the adjustment brush. And all these sliders look the same, and they pretty much do the same thing in all these tools. What you see at the bottom of them are some of the options for the radius, for the brush, and the radial filter. So if I grab the graduated filter, and I double click on Effect, that'll zero out all the sliders and what I want to do is I want to drag this filter from about the top of this rock up to the horizon and I want to make it slightly brighter so I can drag the exposure slider over now to see exactly how far I want to go maybe I want to raise that just a little bit more okay so you can see here I'm still quite a bit darker 
than I really want to be, so I'm going to keep dragging that over. But I notice that I want to also extract some of that detail out of the rock, and that is nothing other than a luminosity mask if you look at it in terms of taking the shadows up, but you're taking the shadows up only in this area where the mask was made. Remember, 100% of this mask starts right at the top of the rock and extends down to the bottom of the picture. From the top line of this mask up, there is absolutely zero change, and there's a nice gradation in the middle. Once again, if I take this gradient graduated filter and I bring it closer, you can see how there's less of a gradation. So I'm going to stretch that out so you don't notice it as much. And what I do notice now is this line right here in the background, and so I'm going to have to lower some of that luminosity so that I can bring these tonal values together. Then I want to make a new one, and this one's going to be not linear, so I'm going to use the radial filter. And in this case, I don't know why Adobe did this. I'm going to make it brighter, but I'm going to check the box to invert it. And what that means is that simply it's going to be the opposite of what you think, at least I think, and it's going to affect everything inside this radial area rather than outside. You can see here by unchecking it, it's going to lighten up everything but what's inside the filter. So what I want to do is I want to increase some luminosity just off in the horizon here without affecting that beautiful pink glow from the sun. Okay. So now my job is to get the luminosity of this area with the radial filter to match the luminosity of the foreground. So I might go back here to the graduated filter and you can see this little node appear. If you click on that node, then you can re-edit it. And I want to make it just a little bit brighter in this case. Okay, so it's just going back and forth until you get that right. Now let's say that's the luminosity that I like for this image with some bigger regions. I want to go in and refine just a small little area, and I'm going to grab the adjustment brush for this. And at the bottom here, the adjustment brush, you can see you have some sliders for the size of the brush, the feather, the flow, and then the density. 99% of the time, I'm using this brush with 100% feather, 100% flow, and 100% density. And auto mask is off. What I use to change the size of the brush are the bracket keys. So I can click the bracket keys to make it smaller or bigger. And depending on your mouse or trackpad, you can make it smaller or bigger based on scrolling or gestures, as they call it. In this case, I want to make I want to add a little bit of detail to the front of this rock. And in order to do that, I want to add a little bit of exposure, but I also want to add some clarity. And you'll see if that illuminates some of that grass that's so nice on the front of that rock. Come down the side maybe a little bit. And it looks a little washed out, so we can add a little bit of contrast. All right. So all we did was give the front of that rock just a little bit of light in a particular area. So I really wanted to show you that because this is changing the overall luminosity quite a bit and I do this all before I go into the basic tab and I haven't touched any of these sliders yet and then finally I'll start looking at color saturation which is the vibrance. So I'll start with vibrance and then go into saturation if I need it and white balance. In this case I think it's a little blue so I'm going to give this image a little more yellow, raise the temperature up a little bit, and add a little bit of magenta or tint to give it the color cast that I think is more accurate. It might be a little more blue, and in this case, maybe even a little more saturation. All right, so that work order was basically right into the tone curve and find out what areas or regions of the image I liked better when the tone curve was darker and what regions I liked better when it was lighter. And next was basically use the filters. So I went straight into adjusting what I call regional dynamics, but it's nothing other than dodging and burning with a twist or with contrast. And then finally, after all that, then I went into the basic tab to get my white balance and saturation correct.
Okay. So I use that workflow order more often than not in Lightroom. And that's pretty much the same for images that I have compiled into maybe an HDR file from multiple other bracketed image files, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. And next, I want to change things up a little bit and kind of reverse the workflow, if you will. And, and this is just an idea I had from working on images in lab space in Photoshop years ago, especially when we were working on drum scans. And so I'm going to take this next image and I'm going to take all the color out of it, in the basic tab, take the saturation all the way down. And the reason I'm doing this is I really want to see nothing other than the tonal values in order to give me an idea of where they have to be without color. And then finally I'll add that color back in at the right amount. And I, I picked this image because it's a pretty fairly colorful image, a dusk scene of shot along the Big Sur coast, I think, in uh, California. And so real quick, let's just make sure we have everything calibrated before I jump into this. And you can see here I need to apply my, my uh, camera profile. So let's go back over here and check the uh, D800 profile. And then let's go up to lens correction and it looks like it needs to be leveled and it appears as though Lightroom did a fairly good job although let's check that because sometimes with a yep looks like it's pretty good it's just an optical illusion that the waves are actually coming in at an angle and it looks a little crooked so back up to the basic tab and once again I'm gonna take all the color out of it and in this case I see that the bottom third of the image where the water is, the beach is, seems quite dark and in fact I want to give it a little more life. I want to brighten that up. So the first thing I'm going to do is come up here to the graduated filter and I'm going to add a little bit of exposure and maybe a little bit of clarity to give it a little contrast. Now remember I want everything from the bottom up to receive this exposure increase and so I'm going to start right at the top of the rock and drag this up to just above the horizon. And if you hold the shift key down, it'll actually level it out for you. Okay. And you can see now that I've made the mask, I'm going to actually give it a little more life just to make it brighter. And once again, you know, you hear oftentimes, or I hear oftentimes about luminosity masks in Photoshop. And, you know, it might sound complex and complicated. How does somebody do one? But once again, Lightroom has all these sliders, and when you use them in conjunction with a filter, they really are nothing other than a luminosity mask. And so in this case, I'm going to change the shadows only within the bottom part of this image. And you can see how that's bringing out some of the detail in that rock. Now, keep in mind, as you're doing this, especially in the shadows, some cameras have much more digital noise and so as you zoom in on your file to one-to-one -one, you'll want to check areas like these deep dark shadows depending on your camera you might not be able to move this over as far as it goes okay now since this is dusk I really don't want to make this luminosity brighter than the sunset because that would just look unnatural and weird in my opinion so that's why this really helps. I'm able to judge the luminosity of this image way before I start looking at the color. And this taking the color out helps me do that. So I'm going to bring this back down so it's a little bit darker than our horizon. And the next spot I want to change is in the top half of this picture. So I'm going to click New on the graduated filter. And in this case, I'm going to probably add a little more clarity. I'm going to, you'll see what happens to these clouds and it looks like I want to make it brighter. But in this case I'm going to drag it down. And So let's take it from right about here. And what I'm looking for in this location of this filter is a spot where I don't show the gradation or I don't change the natural gradation of the dusk glow because that would look weird if it gets darker and then starts getting brighter above the filter. 
So I'm going to bring this down just to about, if I take it off, you can see the transitions right in here, right at the bottom of that cool looking cloud. So let's take it all the way down to about there. And now it looks like it could be a little bit brighter and even maybe a little more contrast. The more contrast you add, the more luminance you have to add. See if you, I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit. Now you can see that weird transition that I was talking about. So let's back that off so we don't get that weird transition. And in fact, let's lower this a little bit. And lower the contrast a little bit and raise the clarity so that we get the edge of those clouds showing up rather than the, uh, the overall contrast. In fact, I can still see that little bit of glow, so I'm going to drop this filter just a little more and maybe even drop the exposure a little bit more. And you can see, or at least I can see, without the color, I'm able to judge those luminance, slight luminance variations easier. So now I'm going to close that. Now that I've done most of my edits to the contrast and to the regions, um, I see one more that I want to make. And so sometimes, you know, it takes a couple minutes. You might want to go get a cup of coffee and come back to your image even before you add the color. In this case, I know there's, I want a little more light just on the top of that wave. And so I can grab this radial filter and do just that. If I drag the clarity down, and this radial filter is really handy for affecting regions in the center of the picture that are long and thin. So I'm just going to add a little bit more light right there to that wave, almost as though it's reflecting the sky. Okay. Now that I've done all my contrast and luminosity changes, now I can begin adding color to the scene. So you can see if I go back to the middle, it almost looks too colorful. There's almost too much saturation depending on your point of view. So I might back that saturation down a little bit and then bump up the vibrance, right? And then it's a combination of that and the white balance. In this case, the white balance, the camera did a pretty good job. I might add a little more warmth and a little more tint to this to give it that sunset glow, okay? And so this, this image really shows a good uh, use for starting in black and white, at least I think so. Um, and I'm going to do one more image after that and uh, go over kind of the same steps just to kind of re-solidify those moves with you in a whole different scene. This one uh, was taken here in Santa Barbara. No, just kidding. It's actually Iceland again. This is right near the uh, airport, Joe, where you said you've uh, flown into several times and haven't been able to get out of the airport. So this one was taken uh, probably about five miles from the Keflavec airport. Beautiful place out by a lighthouse. Okay, so once again, I'm going to take this saturation slider and just take all the color out of the scene. And I'm going to make sure that our D800 settings are applied. Yes, they weren't. And we'll go back to saturation, take all the color out. Now, the first thing I notice, if I take this tone curve and look at what's going on here, there's a lot of good detail in those shadows. You can see that inside the rocks when I raise the tone curve. And then there's some really interesting texture in the wave that's exploding when I drop it. So I've, I have more of a challenge with this shot because my highlights are so, uh, they're not a linear, uniform shape that I'm going to easily be able to edit. And of course, my shadows are in a totally crazy shape, which makes the, the image interesting, but makes it a little more of a challenge to edit. However, Lightroom, in its uh, infinite wisdom is in using sliders, really gives you the option to make a mask with a slider. And in this case, because I like the tone curve more than the basic sliders, I can also utilize the histogram. And you see, uh, if I come up over the histogram, and wave the mouse over different regions of the histogram, it actually highlights the exact slider that it's referencing in the basic tab. So for example, if I come over the middle of the histogram 
and click and drag, it's doing nothing but changing the exposure slider. Okay, so I can have my basic tab close, my tone curve open, and grab the shadows and drag that up until I get some of that detail that I want to see in those shadows. I can do the same thing for the highlights and drag those down. And basically I've taken quite a bit of the contrast out of this scene with those two moves. Okay, and then the next thing I want to do is build up contrast in very specific areas. And I happen to think that the top of this image could be a little bit darker, so I'm going to take the graduated filter and just drag it down over the top of the image. And I might want to make it a little bit darker. But you can see here I'm starting to lose some of the detail on the top of the rock. So I'm going to take the shadow slider and raise that back up. Now I have darker highlights and brighter shadows, all just within that region of the graduated filter. And another way to add uh, contrast that I, I noticed that this is lacking because of all the uh, shadow luminosity we put in this and highlights we took out is to just take a very specific area on the curve and make it steeper in just that area. Okay, By doing that, you're really adding contrast specifically to this region of the, of the image. And you can always see by clicking on that little node in the upper corner where the density is, <coughs> sorry, where the density is on that curve. You can see here as I drag the cursor over the pinnacle here, we're looking at mostly shadows. And then you come over the ocean, and this is the mid-tones. And then you come over the water, and those are the highlights. So that gives you a clue of what area you might need to uh, make these nodes in. So let's drag the nodes I made off of there. And we'll grab that. And I really want to add some contrast right in here so we can <clears throat> click on the uh, brighter part of the wave and pull it up. And then we can drag the cursor over to a darker part of the wave and drag the cursor down. And now we just created contrast in the middle of that wave without affecting the majority of the image too much. Okay, we can see our change here just like that. The next move uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to take the brush tool and I'm just going to add a little bit of contrast or luminosity actually inside the wave itself because I think it looks a little dull and I'm going to add a little bit of luminance here. Let's make it a little brighter just in certain areas. And you can see actually that washes, that's washing it out. So what I'm going to do is probably drag that back down and add a little bit of clarity. Okay, so now I've done most of my contrast work and I'm going to go back to the basic tab again and start adding the color back in. Bring it back to zero and take a look. And now it's a combination of the white balance because I remember this late light streaming in but I don't remember that much blue so I'm going to warm this whole thing up and add the proper amount of tint, magenta. And you can see just with a white balance change that I have most of the color that I want back in the scene. I might want to add a little bit more vibrance and then I'm done. Okay, so once again, in this case I started with a black and white image, changed the contrast and luminosity, changed certain regions of the contrast and luminosity, and then finally added the color. Um, just a couple you know, a different way of looking at working particular images. And so uh, at this point, I, wanna, I don't want to go on any further into, uh, into lab space and Photoshop until I look at potential questions that you guys might have. So Joe, if you want to ask them. Absolutely. Me, oh, let's hear all about the lab space. No, I'm only, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, there are... <laughs> Uh, a couple people are asking about, well, a handful of things. Uh, a couple of easy ones first. One, do you use DNG when you're in Lightroom? Okay. Um, I convert to DNG after I've decided that it's an image file that I'm going to archive and keep forever and ever. So uh, upon importing, I do not convert to DNG when I'm out in the field. Mm -hmm. It just takes twice as long. And Okay. Um, the, with the color checker. 
Uh, how often do you take a shot of it? Do you do you use it frequently when you're on location, or do you just create a couple of profiles? I have three like three different lighting profiles for each camera. Ideally, you have one for uh, midday, and then you have one for shade or sunny, I should say, sunny, shady, and then sunset. Uh, one thing I think folks should understand is that, that that a profile is adjustments for the color spectrum. You're still going to have your white balance changing through the course of the day, which is separate from the profile, but they do work together. Yes, uh, absolutely. And on the other side of that color checker uh, is, on the other side of this flap is a white card so that you can take a proper white balance. So, yeah, uh, do you use right. a polarizer? I use a polarizer. Yeah, it's one of two filters that I use, and the other one is a neutral density. And most of the time these days, I'm using a three or a ten stop neutral density, and in some cases, I'm combining the neutral density and the polarizer. Very cool. It's fascinating watching you work uh, in Lightroom, and, and we all have different approaches to it. And 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 I'm seeing some benefits for some, the, for the, your approach using the curves and, and the black and white. Well, it's funny where I, I was actually completely turned off my curves panel. So it's it's funny to see the different approaches. <laughs> uh, there's a handful of folks that would love if they could see the images you just worked on uh, as before and after. Okay. Um, this one, that's pretty easy. Uh, let's just hit the, uh, go over here to the history of all these steps I created and go back to the very first step. And let's see if it goes back. That's actually the virtual copy, sorry, uh, before I made the steps. So let's go to this one and go back to the beginning here to the reset. Okay, so there's the reset. And that is the before, and here is the after. And I believe we can do the same thing here. And let's see if that takes us back to the beginning. So there you can see my nice crooked composition in a hurry to get that little glow on the horizon and then sort of the uh, flat light, really, that we had. And then the, the edits afterwards. And then this first one, in my opinion, you know, that, that when the light is soft like this in the beginning of the day, it typically don't need, especially when you're looking away from the sun, you don't need as many regional edits. And so, uh, you know, just making it darker helped considerably. And there you can see the little crop I made to two to one to get rid of the fence. And then uh, the final. Image. Uh, how would you define the difference? I, I've been answering some questions in the background, but how would you define the difference between saturation and vibrance? Well, it's a, you know I still don't have the definitive answer, but my understanding is the vibrance is really the secondary colors, and so that's your CMYK, and the saturation is your primary colors, which are your red, green, and blue. Uh, assuming that, then really you know, the brighter colors are going to become more saturated with the saturation slider and the secondary colors or the less significant colors uh, are going to be saturated with the vibrance slider. Um, so that's that's my... Another way to look at it would be saturation increases all colors equally and vibrance focuses in on cool colors and less saturated colors. So it'll leave skin tones alone, for example. That's right, and see, seeing how many skin tones I have here, <laughs> um, you can see how that affects my workflow. <laughs> no, but that, that's uh, perfect. I'm going to have to get you in the studio with a human. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, there, and again, there's some confusion. Somebody asked about uh, when a sunset profile act as a pseudo white balance and kill sunset shots. And, and again, a profile is a, is a correction to a color spectrum, not the white balance. So you can still have your profile and still keep your beautiful, glowy sun that you got up so early for or waited up so late for. Absolutely. Yes. In fact, uh, if, if you don't even create a camera profile, uh, oftentimes just taking a white balance will help significantly. And you'll see this in video. I'm sure, Joe, you're shooting some video now. And, you know, video file is nothing other than a JPEG. And so 
capturing the accurate white balance is Absolutely. so mission critical, especially in late life. Uh, somebody asked life. about the uh, graduated filter. C uh, can you do it uh, vertically as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, these uh, these filters up here, if I grab the graduated filter, and I'll make a drastic change here so you'll be happy to see this. Any way you drag it, you can actually rotate it around in any direction. So uh, the good thing about these is once you've made one, then you can come back here and edit it any way you want. In fact, change the amount of gradation and or the position by dragging it left or right or once again the rotation and you can see how my cursor here changes to the two little arrows and then you can start rotating it and then once that little node has a dark center it's active and then you know you can come back here and edit that particular uh, filter and then I can hit delete and it disappears but you can see here that you will not know there's a graduated filter on this image until you go back into that filter so you have to activate the actual filter module and then click on the filter and then you're able to modify it again. Okay. All right, let's see one more question. Uh, oh, here's a good, here's a question that's near and dear to my heart. Mark, do you ever use a light meter? <laughs> uh, you know, I had a light meter for a long time in fact uh, <laughs> too long so now I don't I, I just uh, use the camera take a picture and look at the histogram in some cases uh, you know especially with video once in a while I'll put the histogram display up in live view and then I can then I don't have to take a picture but most of the time all that really matters is this histogram here and it shows you where your plotting or where your values are in your digital file and all your pixels and that's what really matters and so yes you can accurately create a perfect exposure using a light meter and and it's a wonderful way to work and you can do that I just probably was uh, a little jaded by it for using it for so long with my 4x5 camera and other film cameras that uh, um, I'm kind of rebellious well if you guys want to hear an alternate point of view join me next thursday that's exactly what i'm doing a program and <laughs> using a light meter to protect those highlights so uh, we're going to get you to get your light meter back out of the closet there well Mark. that's joe i think i'm going to have to <laughs> listen in it's been a while all right well listen uh we're, we're getting close on time so let me let me you get you back to what you're doing if you wanted to do uh show us another demo okay Thanks, Joe. And uh, the last thing I want to show you uh, is just a, an old trick that has come up uh, recently, and that is uh, with talking about working in black and white first and then into color, at least in Lightroom. Because the concept came to me when I was thinking about lab space. And lab space is great in that it really separates your luminance from your chroma or your color. And so you're not able to work in lab space in Lightroom at this point. Uh, maybe it'll come in the future. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this image, which is pretty much flatter than a flicker and taken in Death Valley in the morning, and open it into lab space in Photoshop. And so, first of all, though, I'm going to set my tonal range, and I'm going to bring this top of this curve over and add appropriate blacks to the scene, and that'll help quite a bit. And you can see the white balance is off a little bit. And this was just, uh, let's check that it was actually captured. Yep, it's auto white balance in the camera. Okay, and then we'll make sure that the uh, our profile's on it. I actually should have done that before I hit the tone curve. And we'll come back here and set the tonal range again. Drag that across. Okay, and all I'm going to do is come up here to photo, edit in and open it in CC or Creative Cloud. And so this will take just a second. And basically, uh, lab space is great for two things. One is, like I said, you can control the color from the chroma, but you can also sharpen it in lab space. And I'll show you that at the end. So what you want to do is come up to Image, Mode, and there you have 
grayscale, RGB, CMYK, lab and multi-channel, what we want to do is choose lab color. Okay, doesn't change the image appearance at all. But here's what happens. If I come up to a, and create a curves adjustment layer, curves are just my favorite and so uh, you know I, I enjoy sliders, they're fun, but I also became very familiar with curves and so just a quick uh, rundown on them. The lower left hand side of the curves palette are your blacks. And if you drag that all the way over, you'll turn the image black. If you drag it up, you'll eliminate all your blacks. The upper right hand corner are your, represent your whites. If you drag that down, you'll simply get rid of the whites. And drag it across, you can see you're minimizing your dynamic range or tonality. But here's the clincher you have the lightness right here channel and then below that you have the A and B channel and so let's go into the A channel and what I want to do is I want to add independently of contrast I just want to add saturation and so what I'm going to do is add color contrast to the scene and if you bring the center of this curve back to the center of the chart then you won't create ugly wacky colors okay so we're going to drag this one down and this one up equally and sometimes you have to play with this if you want them a little warmer or less okay and that is the edit I want to show you because basically you just saturated everything you added all this chroma and you haven't changed the contrast at all and What's also nice about this is that you can do just the reverse. You can come back into lightness and modify the contrast. Now when I was when I work in Photoshop, I love to keep everything on a separate layer. And so right now in the layers palette, I have the background layer and then I just created the curves layer which I used for adjusting the chroma or the A and B channel. And by the way, the A channel represents your cyan and magenta and the blue channel represents the uh, blue or the B channel represents the blue to yellow so I'm gonna make a new adjustment layer and in this one I'm only going to adjust the luminance in order to add some contrast and so you can see here it takes a little bit to get used to these edits because when you add contrast like this inside the tone curve in Lightroom you're actually adding all that saturation to the colors as well but in lab space you as I mentioned you can perform this edit independently and so, so you might want to make it a little darker add a little more contrast and then let's say I want to actually change the amount of color or the tone cast I guess you could call back in one of the channels and let's go into the A channel and it looks like there's a little bit of cyan in here so I'm going to take some of that cyan out and just warm it up a tad and you can see how you can refine it and being that these are masks as well if you run into an area where you have a little too much color in one of these areas you can do what's called changing the opacity of the layer so if there's too much color in here I can bring the opacity down and you can see I can dial that in so that's one of the reasons I add more color and more contrast than I think I will want in the end. So let's say that's the accurate amount of color. Come up here to the luminosity change and then dial that back down if I want. And you can see how this could work better in different regions and so I might go in here and grab the brush tool up here in the upper left hand corner and with my preferences set to the opacity being let's say 30 percent so more close and I can change the size of the brush with the bracket keys and I want to change my background color I'm going to paint away some of that saturation or luminosity change just in the back of the image and you can see this mask is changing color and it shows you the area that I painted right there so this is another way of working. The uh, lab workspace is, uh, or workflow is wonderful. You can also, when you're done with this, I just wanted to show you this kind of briefly so you could understand why it would be so great if we could separate the chroma from the luminosity in Lightroom. Maybe that'll come someday. Uh, for the other reason that uh, when you sharpen, if you come up here to the channels tab 
and you highlight only the lightness channel, then you're able to sharpen simply that channel. And so I typically use the Smart Sharpen feature. And in this case, I'll just go with the defaults and say OK. And what's happening now is you're actually sharpening the pixels that have density differences and not chroma differences. And therefore, you get a little less noise. This will benefit some images, uh, most images that have big open skies at night um, or in the morning. So in this case, there's a lot of detail in here. It probably the sharpening method wouldn't make as big a difference as it would uh, on a night scene. Okay. So once you're done in lab space, you can keep your layers and save it. And the beauty of that is that if I do that, I can go back into Lightroom and I can work on it more inside Lightroom and it will look at it as an RGB file and once again you can then add all your other changes if you want more contrast you see there it's adding more contrast and more color so it's back to a 16-bit RGB file okay the last thing I want to show you guys today is uh, this is a file that was created by combining seven images bracketed one stop apart from the highlights to the shadows. And the file was merged together in what's called HDRsoft Merge to 32-bit. And that's the uh, video that I mentioned earlier. And that's how you do that. And the actual procedure is on our website, on our blog. And I have a little video there that explains it. Part 3, Merge to 32-bit. But I want to show you the benefit of this. You can see here this file uh, is, is not yet edited and I'm going to go through the black and white workflow real quick with you once again. Take all the color out of it and now I can see that my sky, how much brighter it is and how much luminance I think to make this image exciting this area is going to need down in the bushes. And So the first move I'm going to make is with the graduated filter and I'm going to make that lower area just a little bit brighter quite a bit brighter and by adding the clarity I also bump up the contrast as well Then I'm gonna make a new one and in this case I don't want as much contrast and I want to make the sky darker and so I'm gonna bring the sky luminance down and so now I'm gonna take a look at the image and realize it's coming together the tonality is similar and I, my eye is able to wander in different parts of the picture I want to exaggerate the light around the bush so I'm going to grab the radial filter and increase the exposure a little bit and then you can see here I'm just adding a little bit of luminance to that area right around the bush and I'm done and now I'm going to start adding the color back in you can see here that I probably need even a little more contrast and so I can go into the tone curve and this is where I can use two spots to just bump up the luminosity and maybe bring down the shadows a little bit and as I do this I'm actually editing I'm actually messing up the sky a little bit and knowing that I have a separate filter there now that I got my bushes right about where I want it the sky is too bright so knowing I have a separate filter there I can just go back into the graduated filters activate it and I can try one of two things. I can bring down the highlights and sometimes that might get funky. If it does then you just bring down the exposure more. Okay. And this is a good opportunity to show you one other edit which is the hue saturation and luminance. Um, I don't use this often because I really like to go in and edit a region rather than just the luminance of a certain color channel for the whole image. So in this case, I'm going to go into saturation, and I just want to take the saturation down in the sky. And, and what I did is I clicked on this little button here right next to saturation, and then I drug it up over to the area that I wanted less saturation in, and then I slid it down. If I slide it up, you can see it adds saturation and vice versa. So by taking that down, then I can come back to my vibrance, and add a little color to the rest of the image and then the blues aren't too saturated. Okay. And the last thing I want to do is show you that this is a 32-bit file 
And so you can see you have this massive range of 20 stops from left to right instead of five. And that's the benefit. So if those shadows look a little dark, you can take the shadow slider, drag it up, and you have twice as much dynamic range as you used to. So it's a wonderful file to work on. Um, typically, I don't use bracketed exposures, at least seven of them, unless I'm looking straight into the sun. So this was a good example to show you. So once again, uh, working black and white to color, I hope that uh, it's helped uh, give you an idea of another way to approach adjusting your images. What do you do in Photoshop versus Lightroom? It's, it's less and less the more they add to the filters in Lightroom. I think that's a key element in Lightroom the less work I have to do inside Photoshop. One of the main reasons I go into Photoshop nowadays is to make a, a really refined mask. So if I had to mask this bush, for example, with all those little sticks and twigs, I would definitely do that in Photoshop. Um, there's just not an easy, efficient way to do it in Lightroom. There might come the time. It's possible to do right now, but it just takes longer. So. And then, of course, the, the benefit of sharpening. If I have a large print order, in other words, a large print, and the file, the native resolution of the file is, let's say, 20 by 30, and somebody orders a 80-inch print, oftentimes I'll take the time to size it up in Photoshop and then refine the sharpening methods because that's where it's more critical. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. Oh, okay. uh, everybody loved no it. The comments in the chat room were phenomenal. Uh, great tips. I uh, look forward to trying some of them out myself, and I'm, one of these days I'm going to get you to drag that light meter out of the closet. <laughs> so again, Mark, thank Absolutely. you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you guys for watching. Thanks for the great questions. And Mark, thank you again so much, and have a great trip. And congratulations on your daughter's graduation. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Joe, for having me. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.